science enthusiasts, welcome to SciChat. Every week we bring you an amazing guest to enthrall you with their area of knowledge. My name is Jason Zakowski, aka Dad Guy. I'm the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. My co-host is with the mostest is... Chris Zakowski, I'm here with uh, Barky Bunsen. Uh, it- he isn't barking until <laughs> just right now. We are. Can you hear him? Yeah, I can hear him. He's barking quite a bit. Um, we are yeah. multicasting to Clubhouse, to yeah. Wisdom, to Facebook Live, to the Pack Plus, to Twitter Spaces. Hello and welcome. Um, Dr. Gail Barnes is our amazing guest tonight. Uh, Doc, how are you doing? I'm very well. Very happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> So if you've never joined SciChat before, we do a little interview with our guests so so everybody can get to know who they are and what they're about. And then we'll take speaking requests um, to ask questions about what our science guest has knowledge in, right? Um, I think as much as you and I would like to talk about space, that's not necessarily something that um, I'm not, I'm an expert in and and our guest is, is, you know, probably could talk lots about space, but we got to make sure we keep things on track. So, Dr. Barnes, um, where are you in the world? Right now, I'm in the Midwest near Chicago. (laughs) Okay. And I introduced you as Dr. Barnes. What is your training in science? I have a PhD in applied chemistry in food science and then a couple of degrees in uh, biology and biological sciences as well. So we, you were a guest early in season four of the science podcast a while ago. Um, and we, we had talked like, um, your, your path into science wasn't a straight line. You didn't just go straight for PhD food, food science. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, perhaps it was apt that I landed up in a, in food science because I came to a fork in the road and I had to take it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, you do use forks for food. Were you always interested in science when you were when you were young? Like back when you were a little girl, was was science your jam? Did you love it? And, well, you know, the thing is, before I went to high school, I didn't really know what science was. Um, <laughs> I wanted to become... Um, you know, a person who worked in promotion for the wool board, that was my ambition. So they called it housecraft or domestic science in those days. Mm. Uh, and that's what I wanted to do. But when I got to high school, they didn't, they offered things at different levels and they didn't offer what I wanted to do, you know, at the advanced level and, uh, so I couldn't do that. And uh, so I got signed up for general science and a bunch of stuff. But in my second year in high school, um, I started with biology and basically fell in love with biology. Why? I don't know. Just a fascination with nature and how things work and being able to understand that. And uh, I really, really, really wanted to study biology. And so I got into university in a place where they only offered 30 uh, positions a year Mm. to be able to study. And I I can't tell you the angst that there was um, before I got in, but I managed it. I got in. I did my honors degree. I did my master's degree. And here comes the fork in the road. So imagine for folks that are listening, here is this person who all her life has been in love with biology and she's about to finish her master's and she gets called in by one of her professors. Oh, here comes the fork in the road but now because uh, my professor told me that basically if I did a PhD, if they allowed me to do a PhD in biology, I would, and this is a quote, dilute the gene pool. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, science is basically science is basically around the world. Um, you know, I told you when we did our previous podcast. After that, I had a perfectly balanced personality. I had a chip on each shoulder. <laughs> you know, so 
what do you do? The thing that you want to do most in life, not only can't you do it, but um, the person who's told you this has virtually sort of indicated that, you know, <laughs> you just don't have it in you. you. You know, dilute the gene pool. That is like, woo, that's really ouch stuff. So that in a nutshell is how I became a food scientist because I couldn't become a biologist. So <laughs> there you have it. Yeah, that's really, you know, that's really unfortunate that somebody would say that to you. I always have to, you know, both my wife and I are educators and you always pick your words extremely careful with your students. And that seemed like that was just a little outrageous. Um, but boy, you showed that that person your <laughs> where you are today and the adventures that you've been up to. Um, you you worked for Tetra Pak. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? I did. Uh, Tetra Pak is a company. It's based in Sweden, but it's worldwide. And it's the global leader in aseptic packaging and technology. So if you know the juice box, um, I think most people will be familiar with that as a Tetra Pak kind of package. Um that's where I started in South Africa, which is where the accent is uh, from. <laughs> uh, you may have noticed uh, I'm not from the state. Uh, anyway, and uh, join Tetra Pak. Uh, join Tetra Pak and you see the world. So I started in South Africa and then I went off to Switzerland where I worked for them in environmental affairs. And then I came to North America uh, you know, and to the United States. I've lived in Georgia, sort of commuted to North Carolina for a bit and then landed up in Chicago, which was interesting because, you know, everybody's sick. I'm from Africa. We have hot, warm weather there. And so now <laughs> I'm in Chicago and you're going to say, how did you adapt? But how did you survive, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> the prairie has a beauty of its own. It really does. And the other thing is <clears throat> very good construction and uh, double glazing. Oh, my goodness. Well, we we live in the Canadian prairies, uh, which is just a mite north of Chicago, I'd say. So it, it gets even colder where we live. <laughs> um, I am the type of person having lived in Canada, you know, a cold province, when I get to, when it gets like 30 Celsius, it's like, whoo, that is too hot. Like who, who would survive this? Um, <laughs> I'm just acc acclimated for autumn and winter, I think. Um, with those aseptic packages, those Tetra packs, um, like there's some stuff that is put in there like milk, which boggles my mind. How, how is milk put, how does that not go bad? Yeah, that's a good question because <clears throat> milk is, uh, it's practically a growth medium. Exactly. You know, all, the, <laughs> all the stuff that is good for you in there is also good for uh, microorganisms if they want to grow. So here's the trick. And there's no chemical, there are no chemicals or no nasties or preservatives that are added. What they do is they take the milk and then they process it so that it becomes a really clean product and then they package it in a really clean room into a really clean package and seal it and voila, you have got milk that, you know, you can be <clears throat> in the Middle East, for example, in a very warm country, 36 centigrade and you can have that milk and it will not spoil. It will not go bad. Now, I'm not going to say at those temperatures that there may not be taste differences because, <laughs> uh, you know, anything, and this is going back to chemistry, that uh, when you heat things up, the rate of chemical reactions tend to increase. Mm. So you do get, uh, you won't get spoilage, you won't get sick, you won't get the growth of pathogens because you've removed those as a part of the processing, but you may have taste changes, you know, if you leave it out uh, in the desert at 40 degrees <laughs> centigrade for a month, it's not going to spoil, but it is going to taste different than if you'd say kept it for a month in your fridge. Tastes a little funky after a while. It's not funky, you know, <clears throat> it's different. 
Okay. But you know, I'm if, I'm curious. I like that. I I'm curious to te- to taste desert milk. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't know if it's going to be hot enough for you to do this. <laughs> no, no, not at all. We'd have to keep but, it in uh, an oven. Yeah, well, you know that that's what uh, they do when they're testing the product. They uh, oh. it's called ex- accelerated storage. You literally do put it in an oven. Um, <laughs> so you could uh, in summer. Or if you want to, if you have a spare oven that you can dedicate, um, have it in at a steady, you know, 40 degrees for a couple of days, couple of weeks, and, uh, you know, then try it versus other milk. You know, the other thing that people always say as well, of course, is that people's perception of taste differs. So some people will have a taste that's much more sensitive than others. Um, My taste via my mouth is not very sensitive, but my nose, (laughs) well, we do most of our tasting via what we can smell anyway. And uh, there are some things that I can kind of whiff at a thousand paces. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so there are some products where they haven't been processed very well. And where you can literally, the minute you put your nose above the glass, you can smell it. Now, that shouldn't happen. The reason that happens is because some manufacturers want to be really sure that the product is safe. And so there's a certain time temperature relationship that you should use for UHT milk or ultra heat treated milk. But, yeah, in some places around the world, they have been known to push the temperature higher and to to put the time longer. And, yeah, for sure, then you can taste the the difference between that kind of taste profile with a much higher, longer temperature than somebody who said just stuck to what the legal guide (laughs) in their country happens to be. (laughs) Well, that's interesting you you bring that up, Doc. I forget if we talked about this on the podcast, um, but when I was in university, I would be a guinea pig in a whole bunch of different university experiments. So I would get money for Christmas um, to, to buy gifts. Um, I would just become a lab rat. And I made a whole schwack of money being a taste tester in the agriculture department for their various uh, atmospheric uh, stored meats. Um, I had to pass a whole bunch of palate tests. Like the, there was like, cause it was lucrative to be part of the study. Like I forget how much money I got, like lots. Uh, maybe it's because the meat is slowly killing me today. I don't know. Um, but I passed all of the palate tests and it was down to like 20 of us from a couple hundred. So I guess I guess I have a more of a palate than a smell, perhaps. Oh, absolutely. You know, there are some people who have a talent, as it were, and uh, the taste panels, um, <laughs> you know, are essential in when one is developing a new product. And yeah, for sure, they have taste panels for milk as well. Oh, somebody, somebody just put in the chat, um, Kendra says, can confirm the milk can sit on the tarmac on the Kandahar airfield in the summer without going bad. Note, the same can't be said for chocolate bars. Yes, that kind of makes sense. It'd be like gooey. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things, it's a, it's a really fun story. I was wondering if you could talk to us about your penguin project that won uh, like a, an award. <laughs> the, the penguin project that was a that was a fun one so when i was based in switzerland one of the projects i was given was to represent tetra pak at a european innovation awards uh contest which was being held in brussels mm-hmm. you know it was one of these things if you've worked for a large organization anybody will know that, you know, somebody comes in the door and says, ah, we need somebody to do X, Y, or Z. And you say, you want them to, me to do what? You know, um, 
have an innovation that we can show at the at the show. I mean, there's a whole herd of innovation you're developing with R and D, but you can't go and talk to people about it before it's ready. So this had to be something, you know, innocuous that wasn't going to affect competitive advantage, but mm. it still had to be interesting. So I was working with thermochromic inks at the time, and these are inks that change temp they change color at within certain defined temperature bands. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun? Because nothing is nicer than an ice cold glass of milk, then if you could have a temperature indicator on the package that would tell you when your milk was the perfect temperature to drink along <laughs> with your cookies and whatever. So <clears throat> I persuaded the Tetra Pak factory in the UK to make me some of these packages. <laughs> and uh, the design we came up with was a little penguin. So how it worked was when you put the pack, at room temperature, there would be no penguin. You put the pack in the fridge, and when the temperature is down to, we did it at uh, the temperature band was around four to six degrees centigrade, then it would appear. <clears throat> <clears throat> so uh, off I went to Brussels, but now I had this problem because uh, how am I going to show this temperature change to people Uh because, you know, how am I going to cool this? I had a single <laughs> pack, one pack, by the way. It was 200 milliliters. So we're talking one tiny pack and me, we go to Brussels. <laughs> so I, I got some of the spray, this anesthetic spray that you can get, which you get it if you've got a knee injury or something. You spray it on and it instantly gets cold. So there's me, my can of spray, and I'm in this huge hall along with all these people from around the world that are innovating, including, wait for it, a soda company who shall remain nameless, but who had air freighted in the soda machine from the space shuttle to compete in the same Context. Does uh, so, does, doctor doctor does it does this company rhyme with sepsi or no canola? <laughs> or can you answer that? Yes, <laughs> it rhymes with one of those. Okay, okay. So you can imagine I'm sitting there on a little stool, spraying my little cotton and making the penguin appear, and I'm thinking I have zero chance of. <laughs> you know, getting anywhere, but I'm doing my bit for my company. Anyway, so it comes time for the announcement of the awards and uh, third prize is announced and um, it's not me. I'm not shocked. Second <laughs> prize is announced and it's the soda company Ooh. who air freighted this thing in from the space shuttle. So I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, who could possibly beat that? And the winner is the penguin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was so embarrassing because the soda people were unamused. <laughs> to say they threw a Queen Victoria is the understatement of the year. Oh, and, my uh, goodness. So to this day, in my office, I have the Oscar, little golden Oscar that I won. I have the framed certificate <laughs> for the Innovation Award. And, uh, yeah, that just goes to show, you know, it's not about the money. And this is really true for I think innovation in general and also can be for life in general. It's not the amount of money. You throw at it. Sometimes it can actually be about the heart. And yeah, there's the penguin in the thread with a little snowflake. Thank you. Yeah, you know, and uh, so we won. And so I got a life lesson as well as a little uh, golden memento. Oh, I love that story. Thanks for retelling it for everybody. And the little, um, the little penguin is up in the nest. That was the thing that appeared as if by magic. <laughs> When we were talking on the podcast, um, you know, Canada has uh, like these Canadian beers, like, you know, beer. And um, 
I, some of them, when they get cold enough, things appear. And that's what it rem- reminded me of uh, the little penguin. Yeah. And, you know, that's a good one to bring up to say, well, why haven't more people done this with milk? And the thing is, you can afford to do it on a premium product like um, we won't name names, but say it happened to begin or rhyme with Olsen. (laughs) (laughs) You know, if it's something like that, you can afford the one or two cents per package that it costs. But if you, you know, packaging a milk product, the margins are so, so thin Mm. for milk. You know, uh, the supermarkets use it to get sort of foot traffic into the store and really slash prices. So, you can do it for a special occasion, but to do it for milk generally, it just never took off, unfortunately. Mm. People couldn't afford it. It is adorable, though. <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, every time I see that little guy, you know, I just smile. It was just uh, such a fun project from beginning to end. That's amazing. I love that. Um, another innovative game that I believe both you and I play is Pokemon Go. Can you talk to us about <laughs> your um, your love of Pokemon Go? Oh, my goodness. I was thinking about that. And, I mean, I love Pokemon Go. Um, I'm a level 50. Uh, but I'll tell you a funny story about when I got to level 40, you know, back in the day, because I started to play one week after the game was launched. So I get to be a level 40. Now, okay, this is going to make the the real sort of Pokemon Go people cringe. I couldn't throw a curveball. So I'm walking in my closest mall, the last bit, to push up the to push up the XP so that I can get to level 40. And I think to myself, you know, Gail, this is embarrassing. You are about to be a level 40, and you can't throw a curveball. I used to throw to catch a legendary. I used to sort of flick it up straight. Oh, anyway. Um, In a two-hour walk in that mall, I taught myself to throw curveballs. And, of course, to get to level 50, one of the things you have to do is how many thousand is it? God help one. Is it a thousand excellent curveball throws you have to do? So I can do them now. But, yeah, I love playing Pokemon Go. Chris, what level are you? Because people may not know this, but Chris is a closet Pokemon Go fanatic. Um, Okay, so I am definitely not level 50. Um, (laughs) For me, uh, living in Red Deer, uh, we didn't really have a lot of Pokestops and um, a lot of activity um, because we weren't a large urban center. Um, But I also have been playing uh, since a week after it, well, basically since the day of. um, And I'm only on level 34. Oh, Chris, you got a ways to go, Chris. You got to catch up to the dock. I know. I know. I, I'm now going to go practice my curveballs. Every day I go to the gym because there's a Pokestop right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you just need, uh, you also need a, a um, Pokemon Go Plus and, uh, or there are things called gotchas, which uh, are the same as a Pokemon Go Plus, which will <laughs> automatically catch for you while you're at the gym. Catch and spin, catch and spin, or just spin. <laughs> what I need these? These where where have you been all my life? <laughs> well, you know, we live out in um, sort of the wilds of the prairie. If you can imagine that, there's a lot of forest preserve um, in Cook County in Illinois. And there are not many pokey stops. And when we started, we we didn't have one within driving distance, which was crazy. You know, it's better now. Um, if people have been around, and anything that could possibly be nominated as a pokey stop has been. <laughs> you know, if if Niantic are listening, this for disabled people, people who sometimes can't walk, and for people who live in a suburban or rural environment, 
and who love the game, it's really not a level playing field. Mm. And this is my, my big bugbear. You know, <clears throat> sometimes I can walk, sometimes I can't. If anybody gets arthritis, you'll know what I mean. You have a good day. Hey, you think you can climb to the top of Everest and the next day you're struggling to stand up from the couch. So, uh, you know, um, it should be the same for everybody. Um, when you get older, it's something that you've loved playing for the last four or five years. You shouldn't age out of it just because – you're not as mobile as you were anymore. Mm. I, that part drives me crazy. And the fact, you know, the rural and suburban players that they aren't pokey stops, um, they could design so that it's a level playing field for everybody. Anyway, now I'm going to get off my <laughs> off my high horse. This is good, though. Um, Chris, Chris really likes Pokemon Go. And it's nice to hear that people still play and love the game, but that's a good message too. Um, <laughs> I played Pokemon Go with Chris when it first came out, um, but I kind of lost interest and she just kept going. So there you yeah, go. Yeah, you just kept saying, Jason, that they didn't um, invest enough in the R&D, the research and development. Um, and you tire quickly of, <laughs> of game. Like I guess that's the polite way to say it, that you... I have a short attention span. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, you know what I did is my husband was the first victim. <laughs> and then I got the rest of the family playing um, because you absolutely, you know, if you're playing on your own and you're suburban or rural, um, you, you would like, I would see these things in gyms and I mean like, uh, I remember there was a, one which was a level three um, creature in the gym, an Alakazam, and I wanted the Alakazam, and I sat for the <laughs> entire time this thing was in the gym trying to beat it, and of course I just couldn't. Um, so <laughs> hence the first victim who became my husband, who became an absolute superstar, and the, the rest of the family became superstars as well, and now... <laughs> We actually only have one who's not a level 50. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so everybody is. And uh, <laughs> it's really helped because uh, now we can, if I see an Alakazam now and it's a level three, it's, uh, you know, you're, <laughs> you're mine. <laughs> <laughs> you can go and you can roll over other Pokemon. I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you can you can take part in raids. But Chris... Yeah. Uh, you absolutely need to get into doing remote raids. Another thing that Niantic absolutely hates is they constantly trying to nerf the remote raids. But, <laughs> you know, I hope um, I haven't seen him here, but one of uh, my good friends is actually in Australia, in New South Wales, and he invites me to raids and I do vice versa. That's and so there's cool. a lady. Yeah, she's called the Lady of Swan Lake. I mean, her entire family um, is also also plays. So when our two families get together, it's really fun <laughs> because you know there's uh, all of us together. There's nothing that we we can't do. And to me, you know, instead of trying to nerf remote raids, why don't they think of this as a way of re reinforcing? The power of the team. Yeah. The power of one plus, you know, one plus one equals three because when you all act together, ah, but they, they're very into the physical. You know, the fact that you guys are in Canada and I'm near Chicago, but we're talking on every single platform that is out there and we've <laughs> chatted before. You know, that's the way to me as my physical world has shrunk because I'm sometimes not as mobile as I want to be. My virtual world has grown. And that's that's one of the things where one can really celebrate what technology has enabled us hmm. to do. That is, but, a, Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the, These audio chat rooms bring us together, um, which is really, really cool. 
Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I'm looking through all the people from kind of around the world and listening and just thinking, how cool is this? That um, any platform, anywhere, anytime, we can share thoughts. Um, if anybody know, wants to know, is interested, what I'm experimenting on right now in terms of food science, my personal goal is to find the or to bake, rather, the perfect peach pie where the <laughs> crust is perfectly crispy and not at all made soggy by the peach content. <laughs> <laughs> Need a waterproof crust, Doc. No, what I'm doing is I'm actually, um, I'm going to say processing because you can't call anything that I do cooking. It's it's processing. I do it all separately. And then I recombine them at the end. So because the crust has never been in contact with sogginess prior to the point of contact with the plate, which is 30 seconds before you eat it, uh, well, my husband, he's been very nice about this. He says that I'm, I'm getting close to perfection. <laughs> I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Do you just keep serving him peach pie and he has to give you some kind of report every time? Yes, uh, oh, I my don't goodness. think he's, he suffers too much during this. <laughs> That's a great experiment. Yeah, very, very popular with the family, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, doctor, uh, before we move to the question section, um, I do have one more for you, one more question, one of my questions. And you've had this um, long career in food science and food chemistry, but you do have like some side passions beyond Pokemon Go that are really interesting. You do something with music and um, posters. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yes, I do. In the early days of Twitter, <clears throat> I was befriended by a uh, band, a heavy metal band in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And, uh, you know, this is one of the fascinating things on Twitter because, I don't know, as a sort of a semi-suburban me, <laughs> um, you know, I, I would think, why would a heavy metal band in Kalamazoo, Michigan, ever want to talk to me? But apparently they did, and we became friends. And so I would look out for articles that are music articles that I thought could be interesting for them. And uh, I found this article by someone called Moon Alice. Now, Moon Alice, that's M O O N A L R C E. <clears throat> If somebody wants to tag them, um, that would be great. I don't want to interfere with my connection right now. Um, anyway, so Moon Alice, who's a gentleman by the name of Roger McNamee, who has a band, saw that I'd shared an article in which his band had been mentioned. And I had absolutely no idea, you know, <clears throat> who he was. But he just had a new CD that was out and so, um, you know, we started to chat about the CD and, uh, you know, it was early days of Twitter. So nobody had any idea about how you do anything on Twitter. And uh, we kind of became Twitter friends and I kind of helped out with sharing tweets about the CD. And then many moons later, when I founded my own company, um, he became my first client, and long story short, I've been helping with his band's social media for 12 years. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in fact, um, founding client of my company, very into music. He absolutely adores poster art, and I've come to adore poster art too, and I like to sponsor poster art that um, sends out a good message for the environment or about the environment and helps create awareness, particularly among kids, about environmental issues. And I volunteer at a local museum. And so if you look at the top of my profile, <clears throat> you'll see one of the posters that I had done for CNN World Environment Day last year. And it was a color in poster. So there was a black and white version. And 
I had it for download and I gave copies to the museum so that kids could come in and they uh, show it. The poster shows, you know, different endangered species. And then the kids could kind of uh, color them in. And um, it's one of the, I call them posters for good. And I like to find young artists who maybe haven't had commissions or haven't had a chance to do work. Um, predominantly lady artists or or actually MX artists, if I kind of, you know, phrase it like that. Uh, minority artists who, you know, one could use the extra cash and um, I can give a bit of exposure to. So uh, that uh, that's where the posters come in. And if you do a search for posters for good with uh, my username, I've shared them all on um, on Twitter. You'll see, you know, there's some really creative posters that people have done, especially with regard to climate change. There's some very powerful visuals by some of the artists. So uh, it's a fun project, you know. It's like Christmas for me um, when I work with an artist because I give them complete creative license, you know. It's got to be their vision. Um, you know, my direction is this is for uh, CNN's World Environment Day. And for this one, I'd like portrait or landscape, please, and endangered species. But how they kind of visualize that and uh, kind of draw that, then that's up to them. And it's, so it's like Christmas, you know, you get this email come in and the first time you see it, it's like, it's such a thrill, you know, to see, okay, <laughs> before there wasn't this design and now there's this design. So uh, that's the music and the poster link, which is, um, you know, quite weird because I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't describe myself as an audiophile <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, a music fundi. I grew up in Africa and so I'm going to tell you guys something that I don't normally tell anybody, um, but uh, I never listened to The Grateful Dead growing up. I didn't know who they were because <laughs> they didn't play them in South Africa. <laughs> um, so, you know, the fact that I'm now, one of my clients is a psychedelic soul band <clears throat> that uh, plays quite a few Grateful Dead cover songs is like really interesting, but <laughs> I love you, my search engine, for the things that I don't know. You know, a long time ago, I, did, I outsourced my memory to my hard drive and I wasn't going to beat myself up that I couldn't remember stuff anymore because one life is too short and that's why we have hard drives <laughs> and search, there you know. You. Chris, did you hear that? That's okay to have tons of stuff on your hard drive. Oh, I am a digital hoarder. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, so uh, don't beat yourself up when you can't remember stuff anymore. It's part of the natural circle of life. And uh, for everything else, there is your search engine of choice. <laughs> there you go. That is so cool. Um that is so cool that you do the, those posters for kids. So is it some, just one, one quick question. This does the, like I'm from Canada, so we don't watch, like we don't have CNN aside from like knowing what it is. Does CNN put the posters on like a special show or is it on their website? Like what happens as it was with CNN? Um, they did have a special website they shared on social media. They featured some of the best. You know, this was mm. a global program. So, oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. Yeah, people had programs from around the world. You know, mine was very teeny-weeny. It was with um, 
the local museum of anthropology. Mm. Okay. So we didn't make a tidal wave, but, you know, the way I look at it is if I touch just one kid who doesn't look at the natural world in the same way now as they did before, or maybe love some creature a bit more, you know, it's worth it. You never know when you throw that stone in the pond and those ripples start to form the changes. And, you know, I do sort of work for some charities as well for kids where we do fundraising <clears throat> and they build foster homes for kids and then um, the kids can sort of stay together in a family environment in a house that has been built by this charity. And I think to myself, I'll never know any of those kids. I mean, sometimes there's a yearly function, so I've seen some of them mm -hmm. and I know what they look like, but they'll never know me. And But it's just a wonderful thought that somebody had a better life and went on to do things for other people and passed it on. And it all started because of something very small. And, you know, each one of us... It, random acts of kindness. I absolutely love random acts of kindness because you never know just how far that ripple is going to spread. Hmm. That's something that resonates with uh, us. And like Chris, you say that all the time about ripples. Yeah. Um, like some of the initiatives I started at my school last year was one of them was the random acts of kindness, um, calendar in February. And I, um, had an activity for the kids to do every day. Um, and they were reasonable activities because I was at home learning, um, teaching from home and the kids were at home. So it was things that they could do within their homes. Um, and then I always, uh, I did stuff with the dogs and, <laughs> and shared that on social media. They liked it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It is true, but you never know. You never know. You, a kind word, um, a kind action, um, they go so far. Mm -hmm. Dr. Barnes, what's really cool about, I mean, we haven't talked about food chemistry in a bit here, but I think it's interesting and, and important to let people know that the scientists all around us, they're they're super well-rounded folks. They, they like Pokemon Go. They do awesome stuff like you for different initiatives. So... Um, I think that this discussion has gone on a really nice tangent. I was wondering if you're okay with me opening up the floor to questions from the community about food science, um, maybe Pokemon Go. <laughs> um, is that okay? Are you are you comfortable with that? Absolutely. Let's give it a shot. Okay, perfect. So thank you for everybody. If you have been patiently waiting to ask a question to our, our expert tonight, we'll open up the floor now to you. Um, we only allow counts up that are, you know, aren't locked or we do back to background check on you. So if you do have a question for um, Dr. Barnes about food chemistry or food science, um, we'd love for you to ask it. I've got a couple in my back pocket, but uh, we'll, we'll go there. Tracy's ready to go. And I think I know what her question is going to be. <laughs> uh, hi everyone. So I do have that question, but um, I also, um, like, um, some brands of milk, you can have like an expiration date that's like two months in advance. And like most brands of milk, it's like two weeks in advance, um, you know, before the expiration date. So is that, does that also have to do with like how they, I don't know, like how the milk is treated or heated up or why is there such a difference? Yeah, um, Tracy, when you're seeing milk that's got that two-week expiration date, that is probably pasteurized milk, and the time-temperature relationship is very different than for UHT or ultra-heat-treated milk. So basically, for pasteurized milk, it's a very much lower temperature, but for a longer period of time, but then you have to keep the milk cold. Now, in the United States, <clears throat> the chill chain, and in Canada, so in North America, the chill chain is really, really good. 
So pasteurized milk can last for two weeks. If you were in Europe, the chill chain is not as good as it is. <laughs> Please no Europeans jump on it, but it doesn't tend to be as good as it is here. Um, and so in Europe, you find that pasteurized milk, it depends on the countries, but in some countries, pasteurized milk is less than a week. So you absolutely have to have that whole chain. Now, between pasteurized, which is two weeks, and ultra heat treated, which is six months, you've got something called extended shelf life milk. If you're in North America, you'll see it's called ultra pasteurized milk. And that is where milk <clears throat> is treated um, with a high temperature for a short period of time, not as high as UHT milk, but it is still high, short period of time, and then it's kept cold. And then you can have milk. Oh, I'm trying to think how long, because we use ultra-pasteurized milk. Um, two months, for example, uh, uh, in under-refrigerated conditions. So does that answer your question, Tracy? Um, that does. And I have, like, seen a brand of milk that does last, I guess it's ultra pasteurized, but it lasts like two months. So that's the brand that I'm buying now. Yeah. And um, uh, just it, it it's, it, it's absolutely super convenient. Um, and what's nice is you can now start to get it in gallon configurations. Uh, we buy half gallons just because they're easier to stack on their side in the fridge. Um, <laughs> I have also been known to freeze half-gallon milk in cartons. And, um, yeah, you get a little bit of um, separation, you know, in uh, terms of when you thaw your ice, your giant ice cube out. But uh, <laughs> there's nothing worse than running out of milk, you know. We have our oats every morning and... Um, or if you're a cereal eater, you know, you, you just got to have the milk. And then, of course, for the coffee and for the tea. So um, <laughs> it's very, very convenient to be able to have milk that lasts. That lasts for months. That's cool. And uh, quickly, I just also wanted to know if you have a pet story. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'm a hamster person. And... Uh, we had a little hamster called Snowy, and uh, Snowy was uh, one of those Siberian winter whites, but he was actually an albino. Um, so, you know, he had the pink eyes and the white fur, but the softest, softest little fur ball you could imagine. And um, unfortunately, you know, being an albino and probably carrying a bunch of double recessives, he was very susceptible to skin complaints. So I was doing a presentation in Vancouver in British Columbia, and I was actually doing it to 640 vets uh, as in veterinarians from around the world. And I happened to mention Snowy and his skin condition, and it, it was just so heartwarming that um, there was like this brainstorming session <laughs> one lunchtime with all these vets contributing to what could be wrong, you know, with Snowy. And uh, to this day, I have, you know, hamsters, unfortunately, don't have a long shelf life. So Snowy isn't with us anymore, but people still ask after him. And it was, uh, you know, just so heartwarming. So many people trying to help and figure out what was wrong, you know, with this little guy who was just, you know, ge genetics were just against him. But he was just the most lovable little guy. And when he wanted out, he had it all. We called it the mouse house. And the first time when we first got him, when I tried to pick him up, he buried both his fangs in my finger. Oh, no. And I thought, you know, a pet is forever. You do not take them back to the pet store. But I thought to myself, this is going to be a really long three years. 
anyway, um, it turned out he just wanted to let us know when he came out. So eventually he trained me to recognize that when he climbed on the mouse house, he wanted out and I could pick him up. And he would not try and bite me. It took him a little while, but, you know, he kept at it and he got me trained in the end and I understood what I had to do. Oh. Tracy, thanks for that question. The The community always remembers when we forget to ask our guest about pets. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, Sissy, did you have a question for our guest? Sissy Blue? Sissy Blue 7. Yeah, I think Sissy's still muted. Uh, Hello. Hi, there we go. Hello. Hi, how's everybody doing? We're good. Good. I got in a little late. Um, I do have a question. I am in Southern California, about 20 minutes south of downtown Los Angeles in the uh, beach area. And I started reading ingredients on food a couple of years back when I was at a store and was quite surprised with the garbage that's put in the food that we eat when people are not careful to look and grab stuff off the shelf just because they're hungry. So my question is, how many people eat the food that has the ingredient GMO or now it's replaced with the phrase uh, biogenetic foods is what's on the boxes now? I was just wondering if anybody is just kind of questioning that or they just go ahead and eat it in the foods, the ice creams, the drinks, the milks, that type of thing. Sissy, I think some people are aware and look out of it. You know, for example, in milk, um, there is, you will see some milk labeled as RBSD free. Uh, which is recombinant bovine somatotrophin hormone hormone free, um, and uh, yeah, the the people who are aware look for it. Um, you know that said, uh, even though I spent, you know, most of my life in a corporate environment, there are some manufacturers that can be really sneaky about how they hide stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, uh, when I was in South Africa, um, I remember having a really good relationship with the health department because we always stuck to the letter and the spirit of the law. And, Unfortunately, people just don't do that. And uh, as consumers, you know, one has to then call them out on that or just, you know, uh, uh, speak with one's dollars and, and not support those people that have misinformation or, you know, you can spot them, the, the green wash and the various washes um that uh, folks try and have. And, uh, you know, one gets to know who is a good manufacturer, who one can trust, and um, <clears throat> who the ones are that one can't. And, you know, some people don't care. And uh, some people are kind of in the middle between they care, but they can't really find, you know, like yogurt, for example. Uh, yes. Sometimes try and find a yogurt that is obviously free. It's not that easy. And you're hungry and you really want to find a yogurt. And so you'll buy something that you're pretty certain is something that you normally wouldn't buy. Or the worst case scenario is being in an airport and trying to find <laughs> anything that is vaguely healthy to eat. <laughs> That is not salted peanuts. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a good question, Sissy. Thanks. Yeah, it's good. Thank to, you. Yeah, it's always good to if if there's something that you're passionate about, and if it's something that's in your food, take this take the time to read the ingredients. Um, yes. Yeah, just take the time. Yeah. One thing, real quickly too, I'm starting to notice a lot of carcinogenian as well as uh, color dyes. So I know for sure. I just don't want to deal with something like that and then wind up getting sick from something that I'm eating. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you to the person that's speaking this evening. 
Thanks, Susie. You're welcome. Thank you. And, you know, the other thing that one can do <coughs> is take a photograph of it and uh, put it up on Twitter, you know, um, call them out on what it is. And Interesting. It, it's, it's always a good test of a good company will reply to you and uh, will try and address your concerns. Um, but if you look at their Twitter profile and you see that they last uh, kind of uh, tweeted anything in the year dot, this is also a clue. To me, Twitter is the canary in the coal mine for any business account. When a business is alive and thriving, they will reply to you. They will address your concerns. When, for whatever reason, uh, as the methane gas starts to accumulate in the coal mine, the canary goes quiet and the bluebird starts to droop as well. So it's always a clue. It's a, it's a quick check. To me, that's the health check I do with companies. Mm -hmm. What's their social media presence like? Yeah. Thank you. That's a good that's a good point. We've tweeted at food companies just in fun and <laughs> we we get responses from some of them, um, which is hilarious. Uh I think Oscar Meyer Wiener follows us. So <laughs> the Wiener Mobile. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think I tweeted uh that Bunsen would like a ride in the Wiener Mobile and then they tweeted back, come on over with a picture of it. So and then they started to follow us, which was really funny. Um Indra, did you have a question for our guest? It's good to see you tonight. Hi, uh thank you so much. Ooh. Chris and Jason holding the space. Yes, I do, Dr. Barnes. It was very interesting listening uh, to everything uh, that you were sharing. I just have a, uh, a question about this organic labeling that, okay, we're all trying to eat really healthy, but uh, there's organic, there's natural, there's, there's so many different, there seems to be different levels of what could be organic and what could be perceived as organic. Um, do you know if there's like um, a standard here in the US. I know around in different countries there's different levels, but um, it seems like sometimes, you know, even on the on the on the fresh produce, I don't know if it's particularly organic or if it's just the pesticides that but you know when you wash it or when you soak it you see floating in the water these like a little chemical kind of filter. I'd be so careful what your thoughts are on that. <clears throat> yeah, Indra, unfortunately the sound for that was really bad, but um, I, I think it was about, <clears throat> you know, there are different ways of describing things, natural, organic. How do you tell what's really happened to whatever you happen to be eating? Um, you know, post-COVID, but before COVID as well, um, we presume that there is stuff that is on our fruit and vegetables that we probably would not want if we knew what it was. So we wash everything and we've got pretty good at washing everything now, um, which is probably, you know, a personal overkill, but... Um, that's what we do, you know, for, for what it's worth. There, there are so many definitions about so many different things. And, you know, you've kind of got me on my hobby horse again, which is the food safety scares that one sees that one should not have in North America. You know, those sit firmly in the corner office of those manufacturing companies where they need to have the good manufacturing practices and the HACCP, which is hazard analysis of critical control points, to make sure that food poisoning scares never, ever happen. You know, it horrifies me. There's metal in this. There's so many thousand pounds of this that contains listeria. Oops, this week on your veggies, it's salmonella. It's listeria. It's brucellosis. Come on. 
that is a management problem. You know, it sits at the corner office. They need a culture of food safety. They need the training of staff so that people are aware of what is good manufacturing practice and what isn't. They need environmental testing. You know, this is not rocket science. People should not be dying from eating food in 2022 because it's got salmonella, listeria, E. coli or whatever. Okay, Mm. off the hobby horse now. We are so lucky uh, in the audience, uh, Doc, is a, a lady named Donna Craig, and we call her Food Safety Donna Craig. Whenever there's like some kind of recall or something sketchy, she also, she always posts about that. So, um, you know, we have her in our corner for that kind of thing. <laughs> um, it's a little, yeah, it's a little frustrating. I, Indra, I know I, I did a, a segment on my podcast about organic versus non-organic products. And I know in the States, I I pulled up my notes to consider something organic. You just can't have anything in the soil um, for three years prior to harvest that is prohibited. So it's a the prohibited stuff could be fertilizers or pesticides. So it's kind of a broad brush. But in the States, that's what it that to be classified organic. That's what it it means. Um, and that's governed by your the USDA. Does that's a thing? United States something something. I'm just I have my my notes. Doctor Barnes, does that make sense to you? Yes, you, the United States Department of Agriculture. There we go. Okay, yeah. sorry, I'm a Canadian, so we it's like an acronym I'm not familiar with. <laughs> you know, for for people who who really want to research this for themselves. Um, I will say that there are some of some things on the list of approved things that one can use to produce organic produce that would surprise you. Yeah. So, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, it's not as it, it, there can be gray areas. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, even if you try and grow stuff yourself, which I tried to do um, to find, uh, I was trying to find soil that would allow me to grow organic vegetables. I couldn't find soil that would allow me to do that because when I went into the fine print on what was in the different soils for organic produce. There was stuff in there that was like, no way am I going to grow my vegetables in this. I actually went for hydroponics in the end. But even then, um, I have lived in places in the world where my tap water has killed my cacti. (laughs) That was when I started to drink distilled water. Um, you know, uh, it's it's it makes me pull my hair out that in 2022, in all places in North America, there is not tap water that is still safe to drink because of either the piping that is used or because of the chemicals that are in it. Um, so, yeah. You know, this is somebody, this is me who wanted to grow organic produce who landed up doing hydroponics because I couldn't find soil. You know, I was going to do raised bed uh, gardening. I couldn't find soil that, I mean, the organic soil, there was some really, really dodgy stuff in it. In the end, I I'd bought this stuff and I grew my flowers in it. And I can tell you, and if you search my Twitter history, you'll see me sounding off about it, about <laughs> all the things I found in the organic soil, including, um, you know, electrical wiring, for example. Hmm. You know, not that I think that electrical wiring may necessarily produce uh, toxic substances in the soil, but if you can see and find electrical wiring and uh, – pieces of packaging and, you know, it was just shocking what was actually inside there. And so I contacted them and said, well, you know, 
it's all very well. You've got this in there. Has this soil been heat treated to wipe out pathogens? Because I, you know, when I was doing my homework and reading, I saw what happens with some people is they buy these organic soils and suddenly they get infestations of bugs and all sorts of things. So I wanted to know, well, you know, you can heat treat for this. It's, you know, like the soil version of pasteurization. Yeah, pasteurize the soil. I was going to say that, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and basically they don't. So I thought, you know, I'm not going to grow all these flowers in here and suddenly there'll be bugs climbing out the soil. <laughs> when uh, when when I looked at all the data on organic versus inorganic food, there's pros and cons. Um, in in the scientific study, when studies that we looked at, I looked, looked at for the podcast and the meta-analysis, there's there's virtually no difference in nutrient quality or anything between organic and inorganic. So it kind of comes down to a, a choice, a consumer choice. At least that's what the, the research that we went through said. Yeah, and, you know, the sad thing is that for every amount of research that says X, there will be research it's that easy. says why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, sometimes it helps if you see who sponsored the research. That mm. can give you a clue yeah. as to bent uh, or whether there isn't bent. Yeah. Let's not get into the whole misinformation thing, which is an entire quagmire. Yeah, it's personal choice and you <laughs> you just got to do what you think is best for you and your family. Yeah. Um, there's a really good video, Indra, if you want to look uh, at by, uh, uh, YouTube. Um, they do educational videos. They're called Kruzkazat. It sounds weird, Kruzkazat. I don't even know how to spell it, but they do one all about that that uh, does a really good kind of like back and forth pros and cons thing in a really fun way um, about the organic and inorganic and, and uh, or organic and, and not organic foods. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Um, Chris, did you have any questions for our guests before we we move on? No. Oh, you were... I just keep going on off. What? Sorry. No, I'm I'm doing good. I have no questions. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Our internet is kind of dipping too, so it's a whole thing tonight with uh with us on spaces. Hopefully everybody can hear me well. Um, we just lost, we just lost, we just lost Dr. Barnes. Oh no. There's Dr. Barnes. Okay. Okay, (laughs) Just as I was saying that we were having kind of weird glitchy things, Dr. Barnes dropped down to a listener. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, Uh, I I should keep my fingers away from my screen. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Um, I shared up to the nest. Indra is actually uh, one of our partners in social audio um, and she does a space uh, two or three times a week. She's got a really good one tomorrow. If anybody's interested about being an introvert, Hey, I should go to that. Chris, I'm like a Supreme introvert in public extrovert on social audio introvert in real life. I'm good. If there's dogs, I'm the person at the party that hangs out with the dogs. (laughs) <laughs> the dogs and the kids they're the best yes no not the kids they can go away too hey, no. Jason. <laughs> no i'm just kidding you're I'm, so good with the kids i love kids i love kids so much yeah the little kids are super cute um <laughs> uh, we have somebody we're questioned by aaron, uh, aaron but i'm not sure we don't have yeah Sorry, Aaron, I don't recognize your account. You can DM us if you have a question. Um, I, we've been going for about an hour, and uh, we've been going for a little bit more than an, an hour. So I think if there's no more questions from our speakers, we'll we'll start to wrap uh, stuff up. Um, Dr. Dr. Barnes, people, of course, can follow you. Um, you can follow you on Twitter. Are you on any other social media platform? Oh, yes, on, uh, on uh, LinkedIn as well. And, uh, you know, my company personify has an account on Facebook and Instagram. So all the big ones, I, I 
used to be on Clubhouse, but kind of dropped out because uh, it was iPad and Mac only. Mm. So all the main ones. But uh, at heart, I'm kind of a tr- Twitter person. You know, this is where I kind of started. And uh, I've had uh, some of the most amazing things happen, so mostly here. Yeah, and thanks, I see in the nest uh, there you can see pictures of all the uncompostable pieces of plastic and wire, yeah. Oh, in all the- oh not appreciating the uncompostable pieces of plastic and wire. Hmm. I see that now. Chris, you must have put that up in the nest. Okay, Chris is having technical difficulties too. Yes. No, I did. I put that in the nest. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I uh, as we, I think we'll wrap things up um, before. I don't want to push our luck. I'm just feeling like the space is probably going to crash. Um, Dr. Barnes, thank you so much for being our guest tonight on SciChat. Um, coming back again after being our guest on the Science Podcast. Thank you for being our guest tonight. You're very welcome. And thank you for asking me. I could pick your brain for so, so much because you've got so much information about food science and food chemistry. Um, I, we could just talk about a whole space about milk. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time you're in the mood. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> the last question I have for you as somebody that worked with Tetra Pak, are you a fan of paper straws? Paper straws. Um. <laughs> <laughs> a love-hate relationship. Good for the environment, bad for drinking out of a drinking box? Um, you know, the thing is, it's, it's a waste and it's a litter issue. And uh, if people would only dispose of straws properly, I mean, we've all seen the horrible, horrible videos of creatures that have been affected by plastic Mm -hmm. in the environment. And, you know, I I, I prefer to drink out of a glass and not to (laughs) use it personally. You know, I don't like paper straws mainly because they seem to disintegrate (laughs) with me. Yeah, And, you know, I I do hear people who – you know, for hot drinks or people who are disabled, who are not able to drink without mm-hmm. a uh, a plastic straw. Um, you know, stainless is an option. It's always how do you clean it? So if you can get a pipe cleaner that you can run through your straw or a very small bristle whistle wash sorry <laughs> I'm, I'm lifting here um, if you can get something that you can keep clean that's a great alternative to use mm-hmm. or bamboo for example but yeah uh, to to train your kids and to you yourself you know none of us ever litter that's that's such a such an issue. But, you know, just to finish to say the, the straws, it, it is complicated for, mm-hmm. for people who um, are paraplegic, for example, where this is their only way of consuming and they can't go everywhere and know that they'll be able to consume. It's the It's complicated, which is why we need holistic solutions and to be able to, you know, make sure that there isn't a a proportion of users that is disadvantaged in some way. Hmm. But if, if we take the time, the trouble and the expense to think that through, it is possible to think it through. And last one, Niantic, can you hear me now? (laughs) Niantic is going to be listening to this space and be like, oh, we need to fix it. We need to fix some things with Pokemon Go. (laughs) They, they, they don't give a rat's whisker, unfortunately. (laughs) But I 
And uh, can I just give a shout out to my friend, uh, dear friend in Puerto Rico, who has been listening to the space. Uh, I'm waving at you, my raiding partner from Puerto Rico. And uh, who else is on here from Pokemon Go? Chris, you absolutely, <laughs> we need to chat separately um, about, and we need to invite you to raids. Uh, my friend from Puerto Rico is here. You can see um, uh, Hysteria SSL TL45. Uh, send them an emoji. <laughs> I'm being careful here in case I cut myself off. But, uh, you know, there's a really nice uh, group of people on Twitter that one can send, uh, well, one can play Pokemon to and uh, they can invite you to play in their countries to do raids in their countries. And it's just so much fun, you know, Pokemon without borders. I love it. I love I, it. I tried to clap. I waved instead. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's the new emojis. I'm happy 100 is back. 100. Me too. <laughs> well, Dr. Barnes, thanks for being our guest tonight. We'll just do our little wrap up. So uh, once again, thanks to our guest tonight, Dr. Barnes, who talked to us about food chemistry, but also a bunch of things that give you a really good idea that scientists are well-rounded, normal people that have cares and they're empathetic and they have great ideas um, and play Pokemon Go and are a level 50 person. Holy man, I think I'm level 16. Um, to all of our speakers that came up to ask a question, thanks so much. And to our listeners tonight, thanks for listening in. You could be anywhere in the world, but you're here listening to us. Shout out to the folks listening on Facebook Live. Shout out to Wisdom. And shout out to shout out to the couple people who stuck around on Clubhouse. Thanks for that. Um, and everybody on Twitter Spaces, thanks for being a home for us for social audio. And thanks for being a good co-host, Chris. Even